Aloha, it's Dave Lawrence, and uh, a real pleasure here. We're, we're in between Buffett shows, and it's a pilgrimage for Parrot Heads. It's an opportunity for me to get to talk to a guy who's been part of Jimmy Buffett's life for decades, uh, Michael Utley. He's the music director of the band. He's the keyboardist, and maybe you know him best as right during the middle of Volcano, Jimmy Buffett says, Mr. Utley. So we welcome him now. Aloha and mahalo, my brother. Aloha and mahalo. How's, how's your trip been so far this time? Excellent, excellent. Uh, we had a great show in Maui uh, at the uh, Maui Arts and Cultural Center. Mac. The Mac. The Mac, the Mac, yeah. And it, they've really done a great job. They built a, a, a permanent stage there, which wasn't there the last time we were there. So you're in the outdoor pavilion area. Yes, yeah, exactly. And it's, uh, it was a, uh, it's, it's so nice to, to play in an intimate setting, even though there were around three to 4,000 people there. That's still intimate for us. And, uh, you know, just being that close to the people, it was just, it was exciting. Yeah, and this is a band, when you're playing like Gillette Stadium or Giant Stadium, the kind of gigs that you guys do, uh, you guys have done Giants, right? No, we, we did Gillette. We hadn't, uh, we- Never did Giants. Uh, you talking about the New York Giants? Yeah, the one in Jersey, North Jersey. God, no, we did, we did the arena there once, one winter. The, the Meadowlands? Yeah, yeah, exactly, but uh, yeah. Unless I've forgotten. Yeah, because I remember, I remember the yeah. Gillette one, and because uh, you did got, two the, we did two of those, uh, two weekends in a row. Yeah. Uh, you guys are huge in New England. I can actually have New England roots, so I, I can. I'm always bragging to people, uh, or not bragging, but describing in amazement uh, when you guys would come and do the Tweeter Center there for like four nights, and all the tickets would be sold in advance. It'd be like the beginning of the summer, and the tickets are already gone. Maybe you can explain it to me why Jimmy is so popular in New England. Is that is that the so you're sort of answering another question? So in terms of regional popularity, um, high points is that that's a really strong area? Uh, definitely, definitely. That and the other strong area uh, is, for some unknown reason, is the Midwest, and I, I'm not sure why. And it wasn't always that way. You know, we see, we've seen it change. Uh, you know, the, Jimmy's first popularity was probably Florida and and some bit of texas but really florida and now that's people have come to accept accept him there so it's not as it's not as but you go to you go to alpine valley in wisconsin it is crazy i mean there's thirty seven thousand people there and uh and uh, most of them a lot of them wearing their um their uh hula outfits with cheese heads yeah we uh we've made uh, some comments about uh uh, you know, from the stage, because they will. They'll wear their cheese hats, you know. They're kind of mixing the cultures together. Exactly, exactly. There's nothing wrong with mixing cultures. Right. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big fan. <laughs> I can tell. No, absolutely. But that's, a, uh, that's interesting that you would have that. I had wondered, because the demand for Buffett in New England is, uh, it's unbelievable. It's grateful. It was Grateful Dead level. This is back in the late 90s, you know, throughout the 90s that I remember it. But it was the kind of ticket demand. So you're, so that is not uniform in every single place. The way that, that the Tweeter Center thing was, that was an anomaly on the tour. Uh, yeah, I think so, but it it it, uh, it it didn't start that way. That's what I'm. It built. But yeah, it built. It definitely. You know, I think we o- opened. Uh, uh, what's the original name? Of Great Woods. Great Woods. Uh, back whenever it opened, uh, and uh, several years ago, we've been playing. We've been doing this a long time. You know, eighty six. It opened. Eighty six. Well, that's the year we played it. I'm pretty sure it opened. I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not from Boston. But I lived there for twelve years, so a lot of the folklore is like my folklore now. So it was right around then. But yeah, so you were part of the opening season. Wow. Yeah, and and then it it grew from there. You know, Cincinnati was always. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to different locations where where. It occurs to you, you're big. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, we did I think f- uh, five shows in six days in Cincinnati at River Bend. And that was that was that was like the the beginning of it, and that's around the same time, around eighty five, eighty six, that we did those shows, uh, and that's when the uh, parent head phenomena. We just started noticing it, uh, and they were doing feature articles. Well, I think they did them in Boston. Uh, uh, Steve Morse yeah. is the writer, uh, who's a, a dear friend, and uh, he's always followed. He's always been a big fan of Jimmy's, even when you know when he was playing uh, Paul's Mall for thirty people. That's a that was a club that uh, we used to play in the seventies. Epic like, club there, brother. Yeah, it was. It was you know there were clubs. the jazz workshop. Oh yeah, there there were all kind of uh, folk clubs around the country, 
and, and Paul's Mall was the one in Boston. Did you know Fred Taylor, the promoter? No, I, I'm not. I wasn't familiar with Fred, but uh, uh, he, um, but he played that one. And uh, but anyway, so Steve's been following him, and he used. To, I think he did some articles on the the parrot head phenomenon. Sure. Yeah. In that area. It, it's interesting the way you when you date it to that point because that's right when the Grateful Dead's Renaissance came about, sort of the Touch of Grey era of the Dead in the late in the late eighties from like eighty six, eighty seven, eighty eight when they began to have this enormous resurgence with young people. It's almost like when you're saying the Buffett started hitting the multi night phenomena in these some of these in these towns, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh and I don't know what, you know, because I've been with him since the first. I saw the rise from Come Monday to Margaritaville, which naturally happens when you have a hit record with any artist. And then I saw the sort of the settling down, the, the, the ebb uh, 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 going back to a sort of a normal state. And then all of a sudden it started building again with these. And that's when the people started coming in costume. And uh, and the tailgating, you know, became a, you know, which is sort of something that's similar, I think, to the deads. Yeah, and to, and and to be a uh, destination, you know, dead concerts were that way. You know, you just go and see. In fact, we played uh, Charlotte uh, one weekend, Charlotte, North Carolina, and the dead had been there three nights, and we were there two nights, and there was one. Uh, a couple of guys, young guys in the audience, that definitely on this last night they had been to all five shows. They, 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 they were French fried. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy made a comment about it because he could see them, and they was like, "Oh, I can't make it anymore," you know. But that's that's the experience, you know. They, uh, it, you know, people that there definitely was a similarity between Deadheads and Parrotheads in the fact that it was, you know, a destination. You'd go to. We have people that have been to over a hundred, you know, as many shows almost as I've played, you know. Right, it becomes a cultural thing where right. you don't go to one show, you go to the whole thing. If they're doing the Tweeter Center or the, the Great Woods, whatever, the Comcast Center, actually, as it's called now. I'm, I'm a corporate name behind, forgive me here for the first portion of the interview, but if you're doing that sort of venue, a lot of your fans want to see the whole run. They don't want to see one show. It's very much like the dead. Right, and, you know, and uh, coming to Hawaii, uh, the shell, you know, usually that's uh, more, more of the people are from the mainland than they are... Uh, uh, you know, they uh, is that is that your impression of the audience here? Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it they has, flew in for the gig. Yeah. Now this was a uh, this one was not booked that far in advance, so I don't know if that's going to happen this time. But uh, most of the time, people fly in from quite a few different places. I met one couple here at the Kahala about uh, three or four years ago. We had they had been to Paris. Uh, they had been to uh, Antigua. You know, we did a show down there uh, that uh, we, uh, no, at, uh, is that the island? Uh, Anguilla. Yeah, we did a, a, C, a DVD from, from there. They'd been there, and they came here. And I just said, I wonder what the, they were about 30 years old. I said, I wonder what these kids do for a living. If they can go to all these wonderful spots, you know, uh, but, uh, but they're, you know, they're, they're diehard fans. You didn't find out what they did? You have me no, curious. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to ask. I now was, I'm wondering. I was, I was what embarrassed, but I know at 30 years old I couldn't have made those trips. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's a it does it, it brings out a certain kind of, of thing out of people, uh, and I did not know that, and you would know better than me. I just would have assumed because uh, I've lived here 10 years, and my before moving here, I thought when a band plays in Hawaii, maybe a lot of mainland people go in for the show. After living here for all these years, most of the time when I look around in the audience, I don't get the impression that a lot of people have traveled for the show. However, that said, this follows our other talk about this lifestyle destination thing, so it's a different audience. Right. You know, it, it, for an example of that, uh, two years ago we were playing Las Vegas, and all 50 states were represented. Uh, so, I mean, the tickets had been sold and, and right. you know, from uh, all 50 states. So that's, you know, it, that, and that's an unusual one because... You know, Las Vegas has a lot more things to do besides, uh, you know, flying to Pittsburgh. I love right. Pittsburgh, but, you know, people don't uh, are, you know. Well, for instance, we're playing Des Moines and Omaha that we hadn't played in a long time. I think uh, the last time we played uh, Des Moines was uh, in maybe 85. Uh, for, we did this. Uh, it was a minor league baseball stadium tour. 
that we played, play, yeah, yeah, we played minor league baseball. We did one major league part. That's why I ask, uh, uh, you said Giants. Uh, we did play the uh, San Francisco Giants. Giants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so <laughs> different I get, Giants. I got to get my teams together. Bro, when you have a kind of touring background, like you're, you can be forgiven for not knowing what places you've been to and not because it's, it's nutty, dude. I mean, any guy, I asked this guy on the phone, like, do you remember jamming with Neil Young at the, at the Waikiki show? And he can't quite remember sitting there with Neil Young. So you obviously, for a guy whose memory is as good as yours, you just have had too many cool uh, experiences. Let me ask you about a couple historic things okay. that, that I never got to that, that are uh, sort of your pre-Buffett thing, which I think a lot of fans would, would be fascinated by. Um, Jerry Jeff Walker. What drew you to Jerry Jeff? Uh, we did that in February of 1970. Uh, he was signed to uh, Atlantic Records. And uh, I had uh, just, I was in a group that was working in Memphis. Uh, I just I graduated college and moved to Memphis and was working with this group that became known as the Dixie Flyers. Uh, it was the house rhythm section for Atlantic Records. Jerry Wexler um uh, and uh tom Dow. i mean all the uh, mainly uh jerry because he wanted to spend more of his winters down instead of in new york city uh in new york uh he wanted to spend them in florida ulterior motive <laughs> there was it really was it, you know he wanted to you know he wanted to get out of the city and uh and uh and tom had taken a place down there tom dowd the producer um uh, engineer and uh anyway so uh we started doing their uh, stable of, of uh, artists. And so every week we would do somebody different. And Jerry Jeff was like the second, uh, the second week. He, Tom had done a record on him in Memphis with the same band, but without me, uh, uh, Mr. Bojangles, which was not a hit on Jerry Jeff, it was a hit on the Dirt Band. But, uh, but nevertheless, he was still on, uh, at that time, ATCO records and uh so we did that record and he was hanging out with jimmy you know because jimmy you know jerry jeff was in coconut grove and also down in key west and jimmy had left nashville and was hanging out in south florida and he heard that record it was the name of it was being free was the name of that record and it was uh um i don't i don't know they, what kind of success it had but anyway uh when jimmy got his abc dunhill uh deal uh, he asked the drummer, Sammy Creason, and I to play on that first record. And that was White Sport Coat and Pink Crustacean. You, uh, what a critical, so you get, how is it, you, when did you realize, I'm, um, I'm sort of like the house band here getting to work with a lot of different, so when did it occur to you that, wait a minute, this has become a really cool gig in this studio? Listen, I, you know, I, I was telling you that I was in college. Uh, I was listening to Aretha Franklin and saying, and listening, you know, and reading album. You know, it's the great thing about albums or vinyl is it had album covers, you know, and, uh, you, you know, you didn't download it. You, you didn't, you know, so you could re actually, re I'm reading about the players and where they did it, you know, and who they were. And I said, God, this is incredible. You know, I, and I wasn't planning on being a musician at this time. I was just in, completely in awe of this woman, her talent, and also the, the, the records and everything. And so I get this job with Atlantic, and uh, we signed the deal in, uh, like, September. We moved the 1st of January when we start recording. Like I said, Jerry Jeff was February. In March, I was recording with Aretha Franklin, the Spirit in the Dark album. And I, it was like... I mean, the, I couldn't even, you know, I was so nervous, you know, to even, you know, that's when I really realized I sort of was in the big time. <laughs> this is, this in this is, you know, this, these are the, these are the real, this is the real deal, you know. And I mean, how lucky I was to, you know, have in 69 and in, in June moved to Memphis and in March of, uh, uh, 1970 be a recording with Aretha Franklin, with Jerry Wexler and, Tom Dowd and Arif Mardine producing, you know, and, and there it is, you know.